Hey everyone, welcome back. I hope you had an amazing Pride Month and I am so excited to show you everything I read in June, which was a lot. So I'm gonna try and go through them pretty quick. Otherwise this video will be like a full length film and we don't need that. Also, there's like a storm going on outside. So if you hear thunder or me screaming because I'm scared of thunder, you know what that's about. Let's just jump in. Um, I read obviously a lot of queer books with a lot of great queer rep. Uh, my goal this month was to read all the books on my shelf which had queer rep. That did not happen, but I did read a lot of really good books with Queer Rep, and then I read some other things in between, as you will see as we go through. So let's see what I read. Also, because I always forget this, make sure to like and follow uh, and subscribe. Um, if you're looking for daily content, I do post daily content on TikTok, and then I post a couple times a week on Instagram as well. So if you want all that bookish content, you can go to all those places and do all those things, and I'll be there in some way. All right, so the first book I read this month was The Passing Playbook by Isaac Fitzsimons. So this is a story of Spencer, who is a trans young man who is starting a new school because things did not go so well at his old school. And his new school is extremely liberal, but he still is not necessarily wanting to come out or tell them about himself. Simon is also a soccer player. So a lot of this book deals with him um, wanting to play soccer, but his family is like not too sure about it because there's all these issues when it comes to, you know, trans people playing sports and they're worried about his safety and things like that. But of course, he goes behind their back and plays sports anyway. What could go wrong? Something I thought was really cool about this book is it's the first trans book I've seen really talk about um, hormone blockers, which I'm sure there are other ones that do, but I think this is the first one I've read. So I thought that was an interesting perspective. Like he really is like passing. And so, um, you know, it really makes sense that you kind of have this story where his these new friends and his teammates don't know and, you know, things escalate and you kind of get to see how that plays out. I thought this was a great book for trans rep. I, one small complaint that I had was I feel like um, things were really easy. I think even when things get resolved, they got resolved really easily. And I read somewhere that the author really wanted to have, you know, write a trans book that didn't have any like trauma in it. And I totally respect that. And I don't think you need trauma to have a good story, but I think there is a difference between trauma and conflict, right? And I feel like the conflict here was very, very minor. In fact, so to the point, especially with things that are going on in the world right now, where certain characters were so accepting and so like ready to be like, whoa, we'll just change the rule. Like, it, it almost was unbelievable to me, like, especially the certain characters that were doing it. I was like, I don't know. And the only reason I bring that up is, is not necessarily, it's not even from a um, re representation point of view, it's more from a storytelling point of view. If you don't have enough conflict, sometimes the ending or the outcome can seem unearned or it can feel, uh, you might not feel the weight of it as much because it wasn't such a difficult journey to get there. Um, I think a lot of queer authors are still kind of working on this and um, because it, there is a fine line, right? Like we don't want every queer book to be about trauma and going through these ridiculous coming, coming out awful situations. But I think there is a middle ground, um, and I think this book aired more towards the, there. there isn't any like really trauma in the book, but there definitely is like a little bit, it's a little light on conflict. Now I say all that, and to say that I gave it a four out of five, I really liked the book a lot. Uh, I just wish things had been maybe just a little more challenging or a little more realistic for the character towards the end, um, because it does play off a little bit, almost like fairy tale happy ending, um, which me personally, sometimes I'm not as big of a fan of, uh, but I think a lot of people are really gonna love this book. And I think the representation of the book was phenomenal and I loved the characters and I cannot wait to read more from this author. I'm trying to put my books away as I review them so it gets less crazy. We'll see if that works. Okay, next up is a book I am surprised I liked as much as I did, which was Jay's Gay Agenda by Jason June. This is a story of Jay. Um, he has been living in a small town where he's like the only gay person and he is now moving to Seattle where there are gays everywhere and his thirsty little self is like trying to find a boyfriend and he has a list, his agenda of things he wants to accomplish with guys and like, you know, get a boyfriend and like make out for the first time and there's some other things on that list, right? Um, and so you see him like start to build relationships and of course, you know, it, the agenda plays into it of him like, oh, well, I want to have my first dance in the rain and like, all of this stuff. Um, man, I really enjoyed this book. It's just, it's just like light and fun. And it definitely still has like conflict, but the conflict is more based around like the characters and it's more like Jay getting himself into stupid situations by making poor choices and doing that thing that teenagers do, which is to not communicate enough with the people around him. Um, I loved, I loved, 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 loved the four main characters. Um, they were, one of them is not really in the story that much, um, but I still really liked her a lot. But like the three leads were all fantastic, all super interesting. This character in the back here is 
Oh, this one is clearly based on Jason June, which just made me like that character more. Um, it's just such a fun book. And something I really liked about this book too is that it was a very sex positive book. So what I mean about that is that so many young adult, uh, especially queer stories, they kind of avoid sex or they gloss over it or they make it like the ending point. Like, oh, you know, the first time we're together is like this ending point. Whereas this book was very realistic about the fact that teenagers, especially in city cities, are probably having sex. And um, this book did not gloss over that and it did promote like safe sex. And it it really, you know, it didn't make sex like this huge pinnacle to be like overcome or, I don't know. I just really like the positivity around it. Um, I, I just, I thought that the book did a really good job of making these relationships feel very real. Um, the, the mistakes that the characters make feel very real as well. Um, they felt very like, yeah, you know, I, I think especially if you are a young queer person, you'll read these characters and be like, yeah, I, I did that. Oh, I did that. You know, like, <laughs> there's just like a lot of like easy to make mistakes in the book. And I don't know, it's just, it's a really fun book. It was a great start to summer. It was a great start to Pride Month. It was fun and light and just awesome. I really enjoyed it. I cannot wait to read more from Jason June. I do have a couple graphic novels in this pile. I'm, I'm gonna go through them pretty quickly. Uh, I'm gonna try to go through all these books really quickly because I read so many books this month. Oh my goodness. Okay, so this is Goblin. This is by Eric Grissom and Will Perkins. Um, this is a story of a young goblin whose family is essentially killed by a human. And so he goes on a quest for vengeance. Um, and it was just like a real, it's a, it's, it's one volume. I don't believe it's ongoing. It's just a nice little graphic novel. Uh, I do believe it is aimed at middle grade, like maybe older middle grade. Um, but I really liked it. The art was really good. It definitely has that idea of like all the things that are normally like the scary monsters in fantasy stories were all very friendly or misunderstood in this story. I think it also just has really great messaging about like what horrible things trying to get revenge will cause us to do in our lifetime and why we should avoid that path. Um, if you like things like Willow, if you like things like The Dark Crystal, I think you'd really like this. It's like kind of light, younger aimed fantasy, but it's fantasy that anybody could enjoy. And it was a really quick read with great art. I loved it. Next up, we have a graphic novel that I, ooh, I loved this a lot. So this is The Girl from the Sea. Um, so this is the story about a young woman who um, basically falls in love with a Selkie, which in this story, and, and maybe I don't, I don't know enough about Selkies, but essentially it is a seal which can turn into a human um, for, in order to like accomplish something. Otherwise they have to turn back into a Selkie. It's kind of has that like fa fairy tale fantasy-esque to it, but it is told in modern day. Um, Obviously, this is a sapphic love story. Um, really great art, so cute. Uh, definitely a story with like a lot of heart and a lot of emotions. Um, I I feel like, you know, I feel like we're slowly starting to get better and better and better queer rep in comics. Um, and this to me felt like just such a great step in the right direction, especially because um, this book it just has this great fairy tale feeling to it. I think this belongs on your shelf next to your favorite um, fairy tale type stories. This could have this could easily be a Pixar film. Like it's just really lovely and fun and I love the characters. It was so cute. It was so sweet. Um really really great especially um as far as I feel like they're just I feel like there are sapphic books and sapphic comics out there, but I do feel like they're often harder to find than like MLM love stories, right? And so I think it's it's just great that this is out there and it was really good and I hope you get a chance to read it because I loved it. You might be noticing, I really liked most of what I read this month. Some months I go through and there's like a, there's like some things I really didn't like or there are the things that I'm like, eh, about. And there are definitely books in this pile that I was like, eh, about, but I really, I mean, for the first like two or three weeks of the month, I was like, wow, I have not read a bad book this month. And that's awesome. So the next book is gonna follow that trend as well. So this is The Witch King, which is by H.E. Edgman. This is like, t okay, so to me, this book is like, the um, the culmination of all the pushback of people wanting fairy to fairy stories, you know, things like Akatar, The Cruel Prince, things like that, but with actual great representation. Um, and also this is young adult, but it definitely gears more towards that new adult range. Um, but this is basically your like fairy type stories, like your fae stories, but set in uh, modern day. Um, and it is about a trans, a trans male lead. Um, and it's just, it has all this great representation. And basically, you know, he left the, um, 
the kingdom of the Fae because he was basically told he had to marry um, this guy and he didn't want to do that. And at the time, um, he was still presenting as a female. So he left, became who he is supposed to be. But now they're coming back and the guy, the Fae is like, hey, we, we still are going to get married anyway, even though you're a guy. Um, and so he gets roped back into this Fae world and he brings his best friend with him. And my goodness, it just was such a good story. Um, I, I do believe this is going to be a series. It left on like a really fun cliffhanger, if that makes sense. I'm not going to tell you what the cliffhanger is, obviously. But it's like this quirky little like, it was like a quirky cliffhanger. And I, I approved of that. Um, like I said, tons of representation of this book, a really, really interesting world. Um, basically, they're like fae and witches, and they're kind of at odds with each other because there's kind of, it's kind of like a classist sort of system, but there's like a lot of other elements to it. I, I don't know. I, I just feel like if you ever read something like Akatar or The Cruel Prince or, you know, there's dozens of fae based stories out there at this point, right, especially in the young adult verse, and you said, wow, I wish this had like representation of any kind, this is like the answer to all of that. It's like all of those books, but with like great representation and a much more modern day young adult story that is geared more towards like the youth of today. Um, I can't explain it any better than that. I just, I really enjoyed it. I haven't seen it a lot on BookTok or on even YouTube, uh, BookTube or even on Bookstagram. So Definitely check it out if anything I just said sounds of interest to you. Okay, so next up is another sapphic book. I told you I read a lot of queer books this month. Um, so that is These Feathered Flames. This is the first in, I believe, a duology, maybe a trilogy. Not sure. Um, this is a retelling of the Firebird, the Russian folktale, the Firebird. Um, about It's told about two sisters, um, and one of them basically is the Firebird, and one of them is going to be the Queen, and um, we kind of get to see this, like, mystical Russian folktale world unfold around them. Of course, um, one of the sisters does start to kind of get into a um, sapphic relationship. It's pretty late in the story, I will mention that. So I... I know this book is like sold, like a lot of people talk about this as like a sapphic retelling. I will just mention that the actual sapphic part of the story is fairly minor. That doesn't take away from it being a sapphic story, but I just, I do think it's important to mention that. It's not like, I would not count that as like the main thing of this book. Like I would not sell this as like a sapphic love story. No, I would sell this as a, um, a fairy tale retelling with sapphic elements. I think that's a better way to, to, market it because then I think you get a little bit more what you're coming into it for. Um, I thought the writing of this book was really, really, really beautiful. Um, just really excellent writing. There, there was some of the book where I feel like the plot moved a little bit slower than I would have liked. There were definitely moments where I was like, okay, let's, let's go, let's, let's move, right, move along. But I thought overall the ending was really good. I thought the characters were really, really interesting. Um, I don't think I've read anything with like from a Russian folktale perspective, at least in a long time. So that was really refreshing. You know, I think you get so used to reading like European and I do also read, I feel like a lot of like Asian inspired um, fantasy. And also I've read a lot of like um, African inspired fantasy this past year. And I think that's really great. So Russian was kind of like a, a new, a new flavor on my plate. Um, and I really liked it. I thought it was great. I thought it was super interesting. Um, I'm really interested to see what happens next because this is one of those books where clearly I can see that there's going to be another book and it's already been announced. But um, when it ends, it, I'm not quite sure where we're going next. And that's always exciting. I think it's always fun to like not really be sure where the next book is going. I mentioned that with um, the Infinity Courts. Like when that book ended, I was like, I have no idea where the sequel is going. I, but, um, but that's kind of fun to see, you know, to have that wide open world to explore in the next book. So I thought this was really cool. If you like um, fairy tale retellings, especially if you like ones with sapphic elements to them, I would check out these feather flames. All right, this next one is going to be a doozy. I cannot even believe I'm going to be talking about this on a book two video, but. If you're on Book Talk, you'll know that earlier this month, uh, a little book about blue aliens kind of took off and everybody was talking about it. And that book was Ice Planet Barbarians by Ruby Dixon. So I read the first one and I may very well read the next one. Um, there, It was a very short read. I think I read it in like a day. Um, one, one thing I will mention, so I'll mention a couple things before we get into this. So first and foremost, this is very much an 18 plus book. This is an 18 plus book. This is for adults. I would also check out Trigger Warning because there's some things that happen pretty early on um, before you read this book. Definitely look into it, right? Um, it is it is an erotica, like a sci-fi erotica novel. So that is what you're getting into, just so you know. 
Um, it is ridiculous. It is, oh, the other thing I wanted to mention is I am not a huge romance reader. I don't read a ton of romance. I don't typically go for erotica. It's just not really my thing. Um, nothing against people who read it. Um, it's just a personal preference is usually just not my favorite thing to read. Um, all of that being said, I thought this was all right. I mean, a lot of people, when this started blowing up, I mean, it's like about this woman who gets abducted and then the by these aliens, but then their ship crash lands on this planet and she ends up meeting these like giant blue space aliens. And of course she has a relationship with one of them. Um, this got compared a lot to kissing the coronavirus, but I don't think that's fair. Kissing the coronavirus is, first of all, it's not even a book. It's like a short story with just atrocious writing. I mean, there are times in that book where like the author couldn't even be bothered to look up a word for what she was trying to say. Like instead of saying spoon, she would like, this is just an example, but if she couldn't remember the word for spoon, she would just call it that metal object that you eat cereal with, right? So like, she wouldn't even be bothered to look up the correct word. This is actually a like book, right? And is it fine literature? Of course not, but it's actually like written in a way that you would want to read it. Whereas like, Kissing the Coronavirus is essentially a joke, right? This is an actual book and it's a series. It's 22 books long. Um, it's definitely over the top. It's definitely like really ridiculous, but it actually has, you know, it has like world building. I actually cared about the characters. I think that's a big deal. Um, it didn't feel like a joke. It felt silly and it felt fun and it felt like a guilty pleasure, but it did not feel like I was reading like the, like a joke. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. Um, I don't actually remember what I reviewed this. I would say I would probably give it like a three out of five. Again, it's not like beautiful writing. It's not like a necessary read, but it was a lot better than I thought it was going to be. And I do think it's get, it gets unfairly compared to like other ridiculous erotica because I do think there is actually much more of a story and much more like world building here, even though it is like a little zany at times. But yeah, I'll probably read the second one. <laughs> I don't want to know what happens next, which is crazy because this is not really my type of thing, but I don't know. We'll see. Oh my God. This video is always already running long. We still have so many more books. So let's hurry up. So here we go. This is The Darkness Outside Us. This is by Elliot Schrafer. Um, I loved this book. I gave it a five out of five. I, um, this will not be the July book for, for my book club, uh, but you can bet this will probably show up in the book club before the end of the year because I loved it. This is about a, I can't, I'm not going to tell you much, which is great because we're running short on time, but this is about a guy who wakes up on a spaceship and he knows he's on his way to save his sister who went on an expedition to Titan and um, sent out a distress call. But as he's on this ship, he realize, he's talking to the AI system and he realizes there's another person on board. And, you know, he's like, why is there another person on board? Well, they're both doing tasks independent of each other and they're actually from two different nations back on Earth um, to keep the ship running in order to get to Titan to save his sister. But then things start happening. So if you ever watch Lost, this kind of has that element where, where they're like, well, why is this happening? Well, doesn't that seem odd? Well, this seems strange to me. And just the, the story plays out. I mean, listen, this, this very much it looks like and was sold to me as gaze in space. And it is, but it's also a like really interesting, like psychological space thriller. Oh my goodness. There were moments where I had to sit this book down because I was like, what? Like it's... It's so good. I, I, it was so good. One of my favorite books I read this month. My, it's one of two, two or three of my favorite books that I read this month. I really liked this. I highly recommend you check it out. Next up is a book that a lot of people have been talking about. It's been getting a lot of buzz, mainly because of the author. And this is Malibu Rising by Taylor Jenkins Reid. Now, um, Taylor Jenkins Reid is also the author of J.C. Jones and the Six, I believe, as well as Evelyn Hugo, which are two very popular books. Um, this is a story kind of told in two parts. It is about a woman. Um, we're seeing her, I believe it's taking place in, uh, in 1983, and she's about to throw this big party, and she's basically like a celebrity. Um, her and her brothers and sisters are very famous, mainly because their father is is, well, they are famous in their own right, but a big reason they are famous is also because their father is this, like, super, super famous um, uh, musician. And so we also see them as children because their father actually, like, leaves their family to become, like, a womanizing musician, like a rock star, um, and we kind of see the trauma that causes their family, and so we get to see these flashbacks of them growing up, but then we get to see in the present time they're throwing this big Malibu party, which ends up in, like, chaos and... Uh, it was just, it's, it's really good. I really liked it. I've seen, I'm, definitely people have like mixed feelings. I feel like this is a love it or hate it book. 
These are very unlikable characters. You know what? I shouldn't say that, though. They're very flawed characters, but I actually liked a lot of them. Um, I thought they were very interesting, uh, but they are very flawed, very messed up characters. Um, and it is definitely a depressing book. It's definitely the kind of book where, like, there are times where you're just like, can these can this family get a freaking break? Like just bad thing after bad thing after bad thing happens to them. And it's very upsetting, but the writing is out of this world good. I really loved the characters. Like I said, they're all very, very flawed, which makes them all very, very interesting. And just the way that the story escalates and the way that the story plays out by the end was just super interesting to me. I did think the, there is a point in the middle of the book where the flashbacks sort of end and you just are left in the middle of the um, present day story. But at that point, the present day story hasn't really been established that well. So there is this like weird point where the plot kind of like grinds to a halt as you kind of like get your bearings of what the rest of the book is going to be about. But after that, the, it just gets so, 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 so good. Um, so this is definitely a book for adults as well. I would not recommend this as a young adult book, um, but definitely a really good book for adults. Really interesting character study and really interesting um, just from, you know, a standpoint of what growing up without a parent and what having to like raise a family on your own can do. Um, I really liked this a lot. So that's Malibu Rising. Next up, we have We Are Not Free. This was by Tracy Chi. Um, this is a, last month I read something called, I read a graphic novel called Displacement, uh, which was about the Japanese internment camps. Um, this is about the same thing, but we follow multiple characters and we get to see like multiple perspectives and we get to see a much bigger breadth of time. Like we kind of see different aspects of, of the internment camps and kind of throughout the time of the internment camps. Um, I thought this was really interesting. I also thought it was interesting because since I had read that graphic novel, it, this was, I feel like a little bit of a deeper dive and especially like more character driven, whereas the graphic novel was a little bit more about the history. This, this dealt with the history, but it also dealt with like the actual emotions of the people going through it. Definitely an emotional book. Um, definitely a tearjerker. Um, I, I did think it was really interesting now that I've read a couple books about these internment camps, just seeing kind of there are certain moments in that his, in that history kind of seeing those play out for different characters I think is really interesting and just seeing how different people reacted to these things in particular there is there is like a like a questionnaire they had to fill out that involved questions that were very misleading um that really tried to like I don't know basically like trick them into saying that they were like Japanese nationalists even though they were Americans and it's and also like kind of tricking them into joining the military and it's interesting to now that I've read a couple things about this time in history, just kind of seeing that play out in different forms. Um, but it was a very good book and it was very respectful of this time period. And you can tell a ton of research went into this book. Um, I, I really liked it. Uh, like I said, it was it was a it was a definitely like a tearjerker and a heartbreaking book, but it was very well done. So that is We Are Not Free. Okay, so next is a book that I made a kind of a ridiculous TikTok about. So this is uh, Instructions for Dancing by Nicola Yoon. Um, this is, this seems like a cute little rom-com. Uh, it's actually a lot more emotional than I was planning for it to be. It kind of wrecked me by the end. Um, but basically this is about a young woman who um, her parents split up and she just no longer believes that love is worth ever thinking about ever. She doesn't want to be in a relationship. She doesn't want to fall in love. She doesn't want to think about any of that. Um, and because, so basically kind of this like weird, almost like eighties movie moment happens where she gets given the gift to see people. Like if she sees two people that are love kiss, she sees their entire relationship play out all the way to the end. So them like breaking up or one of them dying or all this stuff. So she has these visions and it makes her like want to fall in love even less. Of course, she meets a boy and you know, things happen. And, but anyway, um, I can't really tell you much more without spoiling it. This was a surprisingly deep book considering I went in for like a cute little rom-com, um, which there's definitely cute rom-com moments, but it's also a lot deeper than I expected it to be. A little bit on the predictable side. Um, so I will mention that I think sometimes rom-coms can kind of fall into that because they they have kind of a formula, but there were definitely enough surprises to make it interesting. And also there's a moment where the story definitely takes like a darker turn that definitely like mixes it up. And and it's, it's kind of that moment that makes the book really step up above other rom-coms out there. Really enjoyable. Just know that this book, it will leave you a mess on the floor even though the cover looks like a delightfully cute love story that would never do something so evil to you. It will make you feel things. It definitely made me feel things. So there you go. Okay, so next is a book that I was really excited to read and I didn't love it. And that was The Ones We're Meant to Find by Joan. I've read this before as Joan He, but I think it's Joan Huh. I think, okay. Um, 
so this is a story kind of told in two parts. As we start out, we see one sister is on an island that she's been like washed up on and she's trying to escape it and get back to her other sister. And her, the other sister is living in this like, futuristic kind of sci-fi like post-apocalyptic world um, where they're trying to figure out a way to like preserve the earth so that humans can keep living on it and if, you know from these we go back and forth between these two characters kind of just seeing you know and they're like robots and it has like this definitely like speculative sci-fi kind of feel to it um there were a few things about this book that that I didn't love I I I didn't find the characters to be as interesting as I wanted them to be um I just I as things played out, especially like there's, you kind of know what's going on by about halfway through the book and nothing ever really like changes that up on you. I don't really feel like. Um, and when I finally found out what was going on, I was a little like, Oh, mm, I don't know. <laughs> it like, I don't know. It just didn't, it didn't, it, it, this book just didn't really work for me. Does that mean that I think the book is bad or that you shouldn't check it out? Absolutely not. I think this is a book that is going to work differently for different people. Um, I myself have found in this past year that speculative fiction and, and things that kind of just like drop you in the world and don't really explain anything and just kind of expect you to figure it out as you go just aren't really my thing. And this book kind of has that vibe where it just kind of expects you, the reader, to kind of piece it together as you go. Um, but there were, there were definitely moments that sometimes I feel like the reason I don't like speculative fiction is because when you do things like that, I feel like it makes it harder for me to really invest in or get into the story or visualize the story because there's just so much that I don't know that I can't even begin to think about what this looks like. Um, and the other thing is, I just don't know if the writing was up to the task of this really kind of big, like, sort of sci-fi story that it was trying to tell. Um, I don't know. This one just, just wasn't for me. Uh, I, like I said, I think there's definitely an audience for this. I think there are definitely people that will read this and like think it's just like the coolest thing they've ever read. And I think that's awesome for them. Um, it just wasn't for me, unfortunately. So I think I gave this a three out of five, uh, which is still pretty high. I mean, there were definitely elements of the story that I enjoyed, but overall I left the book feeling like really eh about it. So I'm curious if you've read this book and especially if you love this book, I would love to know. And I would be interested to know why you love this book. Because like I said, I definitely get the feeling that this is a book that there are people out there that it will just absolutely obsess over. It just wasn't for me. So if you read it and you loved it, please tell me. I'm so curious. I just reviewed this one on TikTok today. Uh, I love this book. So this was recommended to me by Bridge Likes Books. That's her tag on TikTok. This is called The Fabulous Zed Watson. It is by Basil, I think it's Basil and Sil Basil and Kevin Sylvester. My goodness, I'm starting to know how to talk. Good thing we only have a couple books left. So this is the story about a, not, a young non-binary person who is obsessed with this unpublished book called The Monster's Castle. And they're part of this online forum where everybody like speculates about like trying to find clues to find the hidden manuscript because surely the manuscript is done. We just have to find it to get it published. And so they end up teaming up with their friend and his sister to go on this road trip to follow these clues to try and find the manuscript of this book to get it published. Um, this is a middle grade book. It also deals really, really in such cool ways with like the, with like being non-binary, um, how Zed, you know, is non-binary. Uh, we talk a lot about pronouns. Um, and something I love about this character Zed as a young person is that they do encounter people, you know, at restaurants or wherever that misgender them or use their wrong pronouns. And I love seeing how they cope with that, right? Because they do say, yeah, it's frustrating and I don't like it, but it also is going to happen. So how, you know, how can we deal with that in a way that is, you know, adult and positive and doesn't let that ruin their entire day? Because, you know, the book does explore like, yes, there are people that are so open to learning, but there are also people that just aren't going to ask or know to ask the right questions. And so, you know, watching this character, this young person deal with that in a really positive way, I thought that was really powerful. Um, and also like very realistic, you know, you, when you go to get ice cream, if you are a young non-binary person, it's very likely that the person behind the counter will not ask your pronouns, right? Like there are whole places in this country and in this world where people wouldn't even think to ask that question. And then you'll just call you by whatever gender they decide you are. And, you know, finding like watching this character, not let that destroy them emotionally and watching them really spin that in a positive way. I just, I really liked that. Um, there's also great queer rep. There's great trans rep. Um, there's just so much representation. And on top of all of that is this really fun scavenger hunt looking for this missing manuscript of this like fantastical fantasy story. 
Um, it's really good. It also has like little sketches throughout the book um, that I thought were really, really cute. Um, maybe I can find one. Um, you know what? Of course, of course, as soon as I go to find one, I can't find one. So, you know, you just get to see the characters and it was really cute. And I, re and I normally don't love, I've talked about it a lot on YouTube. I normally don't love middle grade, but this is a middle grade bo book. Not only would I recommend for middle graders, I would recommend it for adults. I think it's a book that young people can read with their parents to help them understand each other. I think it's a book if I had read this as a middle schooler, I would have a completely different perspective on being queer as an adult. And I think I would have felt safer to come out sooner because this book just makes you feel so seen and so safe and so accepted. And I love that. So that's The Fabulous Zed Watson. Check it out. The next book is a book that I actually meant to read a couple of months ago and just never got around to. So finally I was like, I'm gonna read this, it's super short. This was Angel of Greenwood by Randy Pink. So this story takes place in 1921 um, and it goes back and forth between a young woman and a young man living in this uh, town called Greenwood, which is a actually like prospering um, black owned, um, black lived in community in the 1920s. Um, and, you know, we kind of see these two characters interact with each other and it all leads up to something bad happening in the town. Um, and what's cool about this book is I, I don't, it's been a long time since I read the book, but I distinctly remember thinking it kind of reminded me of Aristotle and Dante. Um, it's interesting because these two characters really discuss like different, almost like um, black, like ideals and black, um, almost like philosophies. And they, they have like, you know, people and writers that they look up to um, for their ideals and what they think, you know, about like the black American experience and just watching them kind of analyze this and almost talk about like philosophy with each other in the midst of, you know, this kind of like young blooming love, I just found really interesting. And um, I think I have yet, to, I haven't got a chance to look up review because I would love to hear some reviews from um, actual black readers on on this book, because to me, I just thought so much of it was so interesting and, and, and things were brought up that I, you know, even as someone who reads a ton of diverse books, there were ideas brought up that I don't think I've ever really thought about. And um, I just I just thought it was so interesting and the different perspectives and they kind of go back and forth talking about these different ideas. And uh, it's it, uh, at times, I mean, they're teenagers, but at times it just feels like two philosophers sitting down to like discuss theory and to discuss, you know, what it means to be a black American in the 1920s. And I found it super interesting, um, but also I just really liked the characters. I thought that, you know, the story is very emotional. Um, and there, you definitely, there definitely is a lot of them just being teenagers and kind of like that first love, but it was a very short read and I'm really glad I reread it. And I wish that I saw more people talking about it because I thought it was excellent. And it just had such an interesting perspective. I'm so glad I finally sat down to read it because I just thought it was a lovely read um, that I, I left feeling as if I knew more and had a better understanding than when I went into, which is always such a great feeling walking away from a book, so. And my final read for the month was The Library of the Dead by T.L. Huchu, Huchu? I'm not sure how to say the last name. Mm. Okay, so this is speculative fantasy fiction. This is about a young woman who is basically able to talk to ghosts. So she, um, she basically is able to take messages from ghosts to their families, um, and she then the family has to pay for the message. Um, it's kind of a really interesting system. So... Some things I will say, I mean, I already kind of ranted about speculative fiction and I felt a lot of those things here too. What I will say about this book is I thought the writing was really interesting. I thought the world building was awesome. There's so much good world building in this book. I thought the characters were interesting. I just didn't care about the overall story that much, which was unfortunate because the magic system is interesting. The, the way that like kind of magic is just very known about in this world. And there are different kinds of magicians and different facets of magic and all of that and like kind of this like haunted kind of dark gothic world. I liked all of that. I just, I thought the story was just not there for me. I I had a really hard time even like caring about what's going on in the story. I, uh, I mean, this is rare, but like the times when she was just like reading books and talking about like magic theory, I found that to be way more interesting than the actual like plot of the book, which is not great. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I think as a as a speculative fiction book, I like this more than I normally do. And that's mainly because I thought the world building and just like all of that was so interesting. I just wish there'd been a little bit more of a plot that I cared about to keep up with that. Like a year from now, I will remember the world of this book. I will not be able to tell you what the story was about at all because it's very not memorable. 
but I would be curious to see more set in this world with maybe a different story or even different characters um, because I thought the world was awesome. I just wish the plot had been up to par with it. So that's the Library of the Dead. And that is whew, everything I read in June. Um, I'm a little pride hat for Pride Month. So I read a lot of great books this month. I read a lot more than I thought I read this month. Um, it was a great month for reading for me. Um, I just got, I got through a lot of books. I read a lot of shorter books and just like really kind of tried to like, you know, get through a bunch of different books, read a bunch of different stories. Um, I thought that was really, really fun and really unique. And I read a lot of books this month that um, were surprises to me. You know, I didn't expect to love Malibu Rising the way that I did. I didn't expect um, Instructions for Dancing to make me a blubbering mess. Like there was a lot of great surprises in the books I read this month. And I really love that. So I'm excited for July. Obviously, um, this video is being posted on June 30th. So check back tomorrow for the Easy Cats Book Club book pick for July. I'm really excited about it. Um, I can't wait to tell you guys about it. It's a book that I have talked about before that I've really, really enjoyed. And I think it's finally time to share it with all of you and convince you to read it for our book club. So feel free to make sure and like and subscribe and come back soon. And of course, as always, Happy reading.